Good morning, everyone. Um, I have a pop quiz for you today. I hope that's OK. Um, you don't like pop quizzes? What about pop quizzes in uh, paleoanthropology? Did you know that was a field? All right, can we make sure that we get some camera on, on here? Because I brought with me some jaw bones. We'll do math next week, Charlie. What I brought with me are jaw bones, OK? This, look at the screen. Those are jaw bones. The bottom where your teeth are, where your chewing happens. So each one of these jaw bones is a different species of hominid. And by that, I mean human ancestors or cousins. So there's, there's Neanderthals are on there. There's um, Homo erectus is on there. There's um, Homo heidelbergensis. There's um, Australopithecus. And there's a Homo sapien, us, modern humans. My pop quiz for you is which one is the human and which one Oh, there's only one here that is your jawbone. What do you think? Did I hear the first one? Why the first one? Because it has the nicest teeth? It looks like a mouth? Okay. Somebody said second. Why second? Those look like your molars right there. Theo thinks, oh, Theo thinks that one. No, Theo, move. None of those are yours. Yours is still in your head. <laughs> See, yours is still right there. The fourth one, this one, Charlie? Why? Because it kind of looks like a human. That's good, That's, but it's not it. Um, it's the only one that has a chin. And we have chins, don't we? Not only is that the only hominid that has a chin, that is the only species of living creature in the world that has a chin. Nope, now you can go sit down. That is the human right there, number three, with the chin. Everybody feel your chin right there? We always ask what it is that makes us human. What makes us truly human? Is it our ability? Is it our language? Is it our, it's our chin. The, your chin is the one thing that sets you apart from every other living creature in the world. You realize that? We, we say, like, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin, but that's not a real chin. Pigs don't have chins. Neanderthals didn't have chins. No one else in the world has a chin except for you, friends. So rejoice, you have a chin. All right. <laughs> we don't need to look at, at bones anymore. Did you say why? Oh, I'm so glad you asked, Anne. Why do we need a chin? Right? I'm so glad you asked because you're not the first person to ask. At, once we started discovering other hominids in the 1800s, that was one of the first things we realized. Though I say we, but the paleoanthropologist realizes that, oh, none of our ancestors had chins. Nobody else has chins. Why do we need chins? So there was a recent study done in which they gave a couple of hypotheses. Can I show, tell you some of my favorite ones? Um, one of them was that we needed the extra support for all of the chewing that we do. So we have a little bit of extra bonage there. So they did a whole bunch of studies and found that that doesn't actually support chewing at all. Nor do you even need it because we cook our foods and all of our foods are soft and mushy anyway. Maybe it's to support all the extra talking because our ancestors didn't talk quite as much as us, probably, and all we do is talk. So our mouth is always yapping away, and so we need a little bit of extra support in the front to help us out. But it turns out that's not it either. You don't need that to support it at all. Um, maybe it's kind of like with wisdom teeth, where, where we started cooking our food and our faces got smaller because we didn't need as much jaw muscles to chew our food anymore. So like you know, our wisdom teeth don't have a place to go anymore because they're still there, but our mouth is smaller than our ancestors were. So maybe it's like that. Maybe everything else in the face shrunk except the front. But no, that didn't, 
that didn't work either because there would need to still be a reason of it. There was another one where it was like, um, as male testosterone decreased, uh, sociability in Homo sapiens increased. So uh, testosterone has a way of making people awful. Uh, <laughs> sorry, men. It's science. Um, and so as we, our testosterone decreased, we became more social. Then there's more selection for sociability instead of big, strong, obnoxious men. Um, and so maybe this is like less testosterone means a larger chin. There's a little bit of evidence to support it, though. You laugh, Candy, but there might be a little bit there. But then that didn't explain why women have chins. And maybe it was for like sexual selection, like peacocks and their tails. That like at some point, someone was like, somebody developed a chin in human history by some genetic freak accident. And then somebody down the street was like, mm, I don't know why, but that is, that is a good thing to have. And then the chin guy just became everyone's favorite guy. Um, we don't know. <laughs> This is an enduring mystery in the world of human anatomy, of paleoanthropology, of biology, of evolutionary biology. We have a chin, and no one else in the entire animal kingdom does. And no one knows why. I love that. I really, truly love that, because... While there are some things that are like vestiges of, uh, of evolution, like you have a tailbone, but you don't have a tail, for the most part, natural selection is pretty picky. And it doesn't have a lot of extras. It's, it's kind of efficient in that way. So if we have a chin, there's probably a reason for it. But we just don't know what that reason is. It is a gift, it has a gift, it has a purpose. It is making your life better, or at least your ancestors' life better, and we don't know why or how, but we do know that it is, that it has a purpose. And I love this because there's so many things that are, like uh, parts of the body that are obvious, there's, that have obvious uh, attributes that, you know, your eyes can see, your hands can touch, your eyelashes keep dirt out of your eyes. But there are certain things about us that we don't understand their virtues, but they still exist. I think about the appendix. Even the word appendix means, like, oh, it's the thing you chop off at the end. But until recently, we discovered that that is like, that is where your microbiome is created. People who have their appendix taken out end up having a lot of digestion issues because they don't have that nursery for your microbiome. Everything has a purpose, even if that purpose is not immediately known. And that reminds me so much of the reading that we, that we read today because it's so weird. It doesn't show up in any other gospel except for in Matthew. Um, and don't try to reconcile the timeline with the infancy narrative in Luke. It doesn't work. These are two different stories. They may or may not have happened in the chronology that they seem to have happened. The details may or may not be off. That is not as important to first century writers. Um, what's important is the truth that it tells. So we get this wild and wacky story of Jesus who is born of teenage parents. He's a peasant living in poverty. Um, and for some reason, Zoroastrian astrologers from Persia come to visit. Not what you're expecting, right? It, what you're expecting is maybe the high priest, the one who has been reading the prophecies, who knows what's to come and says, oh, wow, the time has come. We saw the signs in the heaven. The angels came to us. We were reading through the, the prophets, and then this came, and the smoke from the temple and all that stuff. But no. It comes from Persia, from Babylon, from the enemies of the Hebrew scriptures. <laughs> you read through the prophets, Babylon is the worst of the worst. They destroyed 
Jerusalem. They leveled Judea. They brought the people to slavery for dozens of years. And those are the people who come to meet the new king of Israel. And not only that, but it's not like an angel of the Lord appears to them and does it like the right way, the religious way. What they see is a sign in the heavens and a sign that not everyone could see. This is why it bothers me when I see art of Epiphany and there's an enormous star hovering three feet above the, the house, like, you know, like the, the Disney sing-along with the little bouncing head. Because if that were there, if it were like a helicopter with a searchlight, then everyone would have been there. But what is happening here, aside from Matthew not understanding how astrology works, is there was a sign in the heavens using a forbidden form of, div of divination that the Jewish people were not allowed to use but that God used to speak to people from a different religion, from a different country, to come and to find the Christ before the people on the inside saw it coming. And so they go where they're supposed to go, right? They go to the, tent, they go to the palace because princes are born of kings. And when they get there and they say, hey, Herod, congratulations on the baby. Um, where is he? We brought some uh, baby shower presents. And Herod says, uh, excuse me? And I love the text says, um, Herod was frightened and all of Israel with him. All of Israel with him because when Herod is frightened, people die. Herod the Great is, should be Herod the Awful. He was a good builder, but man, I mean, he, he, he killed all of his, his, he killed his own wife, several of his children, all of his in-laws. It was a whole thing. He's not a great guy. So when these three people come from out of, well, three, we say three, it never says three. There's three gifts. I'm just going to keep saying there's three magi. When they come, they shake things up. And they ask, where can we find this child if not here? And they consult with the prophecies. And, well, the, the Messiah is supposed to come to Bethlehem. That's, that's where David is from. Here's this passage from the Psalms to prove it. And so they go. And they bring ridiculous gifts. Okay, I, I, I heard somebody say before that if these were wise women, that they would have brought a casserole and, you know, uh, diapers and like ointment and cream for the mother and practical things that you bring to a baby. Instead, they bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, which is just your, this is like, if you're going to bring a gift to a, to a rich, fancy person, gold is like a gift card. It's just, of course, here you go. Everyone gets gold. Uh, I didn't know what to get you, so I got you gold. Frankincense is for burning at the altar to God. This is a sign of Jesus' uh, priestly role. And myrrh is what you use to anoint kings. And so what they're saying is you are, uh, you are royalty. You will be the king. You will be the priest. These are very symbolic gifts. They're wonderful gifts, but they're absolutely useless. And not just because, you know, oh, you can't use myrrh as a diaper rash cream, but like, what are they supposed to do with them? They are broke teenagers with a baby born out of wedlock, and suddenly they've got a pile of gold? Yeah, okay. Nobody's going to believe that. They suddenly have priceless myrrh and frankincense. What are they going to do with it? If they keep it in their little home, word will get out and they'll get robbed. If they sell it, Nobody's going to believe their story. They're going to get arrested because they stole it from someone. So these gifts are a liability to them. There, are, there doesn't seem to be any virtue in these gifts at all. But then something happens. Magi are warned in a dream that Herod is awful. And they go home a different way and they ghost him. And he gets really mad. And decides to practice infanticide in, in Bethlehem. 
And so Mary and Joseph and a newborn child have to run. They have to grab only what they can carry. They don't have a caravan. They don't, probably don't even have a donkey or a horse or anything. They're probably on foot. Whatever they can carry with their hands, they have to now become refugees, fleeing at night, going to a foreign country in Egypt to try to survive in a place where maybe they don't know the language as well, the culture as well. They have no connections whatsoever in Egypt. How would they possibly survive if not for three small, expensive, easy-to-carry gifts? Gifts that you can carry in a backpack, perhaps, as you flee through the desert to safer places for your children. Gifts that would then provide you with enough food and shelter for the three years it takes for Herod to die and you can come back safely. Those gifts which were initially given to them that made no sense whatsoever in just a few days became the most important gifts they could have possibly gotten. And likewise, often when we think about gifts that we bring, gifts that we bring to a church, especially to a church community, we tend to think about the obvious ones, the big ones, you know, uh, music, hospitality, public speaking, the ability to carry folding chairs, you know. But I wonder what would happen if we started considering the other, the other less obvious gifts in the same way we think about the obvious ones. Like, you're a morning person? You're really good at shopping at flea markets? You know how to make a picture frame? I don't know. I think there's probably a place for all of our gifts at one point or another. The question is, are we going to honor them or are we going to hide them because they don't feel relevant or important at the time? Uh, Frederick Beekner once said that the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And sometimes that beautiful intersection is obvious. Sometimes it's a real estate expert using their passion for property to house the unhoused. But sometimes it's an elderly woman with the uncanny ability to quiet a crying baby who would offer to walk the baby Zach up and down the hallway of our tiny church plant so that my mother can have a moment of peace during the service. It's that person with keen intuition offering to sit with someone because the moment they walked in, they could sense that something was wrong with them. I have a friend right now who is working at the intersection of marine biology, environmental protection, ballet, elementary education, and corporate public relations. She found a way to take every single thing that she's interested in and make one thing out of it, and it's magic. <laughs> we are the body of Christ, all of us together. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, each and every one of us is a different part of the body. So we need each other to flourish. The eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you. You are less important than me. Likewise, the eyelashes can't say to the chin, we don't know what you're good at, so you don't matter. <laughs> we all come to this place, to this community with something, Some gift, some passion, some quality that makes this whole collective better. So I wonder if we might take some time here to name some of them in yourself. And I know that can be hard for some people. You might feel like, oh, it's too prideful and self-aggrandizing to say the things I'm good at or the things I'm passionate about, or the gifts that I may or may not have. But let's give it a shot. Let's practice some self-awareness and a little bit of good pride in what God made us. What are your gifts? Where is your deep gladness? That's an open question to all of you.